Hello, everybody. Welcome to this month's um, rendezvous. The topic today um, is air pollution, how renewable energy can tackle this challenge. I think the space is actually quite reflective of what we try to do in the rendezvous. Um, it's about bridge building, it's about connecting, it's about also bringing players together that might normally not always talk to each other. And I think air pollution is clearly um, one of these topics where we see that it's highly relevant for the renewable energy community. It's uh, relevant for many sectors, it's one of these cross-cutting topics that is happening in many, many different ecosystems. And our thinking here is how can we actually bring um, the different perspectives together, better understand um, how the topic is being tackled, um, let's say from a health perspective, from a transport perspective, from the energy perspective, etc., to see how we can build on each other more strategically. Um, from rent to non site, obviously, as a renewable energy network, um, we are we see that um, air pollution is at the forefront of uh, public decision makers' agenda. It's a high priority. Um, in particular, in 2020, it has probably even increased in terms of priorities. And in our research, we encounter as a renewable energy player um, the air pollution as a key driver for renewables in many different contexts. I take the example of China, where at the national uh, government level, very clearly developing renewable energy and phasing out coal is also very much driven uh, by the air pollution linked to coal-fired power, power plants. We see that it's not only at the national level happening. Um, South Korea has um, has kicked off an initiative which clearly goes beyond the South Korean border, but uh, looking at air pollution in a more regional context because a uh, high share of the pollution is not produced in South Korea. But in our latest Renewables and Cities Global Status Report, um, we have clearly seen that at the city level, um, air pollution is a key driver. Now, um, where there is probably a lacking understanding um, is how decisions on air pollution are being driven, who is taking these decisions, who are actually the different um, decision makers who should be aware more about opportunities renewable energy can present, pre present basically in tackling air pollution, um, but also better understanding about what we should understand um, as a renewable energy community to make sure that um, renewables as a solution is not lo lost in the different portfolios of solutions we want to put forward. Um, so it's lots about listening to experts um, outside of our renewable energy bubble and um, hopefully then having opportunities to engage together and see how we can build on each other and potentially foster stronger collaboration. So I'm very much looking forward to learn lots of things and exchange with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Rana, for setting the scene so uh, so well. Now is we're going to go over um, to uh, 10 minutes of networking. And what we'd like you to do is to take advantage um, of meeting as many people as you can by, uh, you know, jumping around the tables. We have given you a question that we'd like you to discuss, and we will put that question in the chat so that you can refer back to it. And the question really is, um, how can renewables directly or indirectly tackle air pollution? Welcome back, everyone. We hope you had a, a good time networking and getting to know each other or maybe seeing some old friends. And at this point, I'm delighted to hand over to Leah Rinalda, part of the REN21 Secretariat team, who's going to be introducing our speakers for today. Thank Welcome. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> also you. <laughs> Thank you. Also, a big warm welcome from my side to everybody. It's fantastic to see so many old friends and, uh, and also new faces uh, for today's event. And I'm really excited about the speakers that we have uh, lined up for today. 
slightly reshuffled the, the speaker order just last minute and we'll get started with uh, Lydia from the World Health Organization. Uh, she's a technical consultant uh, in the Air Quality and Health Unit and uh, also working um, on a multi-stakeholder initiative that aims on strengthening the cooperation between the health and energy sector. So absolutely the perfect person to give us some inspiration on how renewables can um, yeah, support uh, healthcare and healthcare uh, facilities. So um, Lydia, if you turn on your camera and your mic, you should magically appear on stage with me and then I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Just pulling up my presentation. Great. Can you see my presentation? Diane? We can see it perfectly full screen. Perfect. Fantastic. So thank you, Run21, for the opportunity to speak about air pollution and how renewables can tackle this challenge. Um, as the presenter said, my name is Lydia Bebe, and I'm a consultant with the Environment, Climate Change, and Health Department at WHO. Today, I'll make the case for uh, how unintended air pollution is related, um, is related, has related consequences in the provision of health care, and how clean and sustainable energy can play a role in tackling these challenges. As we all know, SDG 3 seeks to ensure health and well-being for all at every stage of life. The goal addresses all major uh, health priorities, including non-communicable diseases and environmental diseases, universal health coverage, and access for uh, all to safe, effective, and quality care. In looking beyond SDG 3, the provision of health care also gives rise to environmental impacts. In recognition, recognition of the role SDG, SDG 3 plays in promoting provision of care, we have a duty to ensure that the delivery of health care does not inadvertently cause harm. Yet at the same time, the healthcare industry is responsible for a significant source of greenhouse gases and other deadly environmental emissions itself, up to 5% of global impacts and more than 5% for some national impacts. So taking a step back, the need for energy in healthcare facilities is cross-cutting and influences many key functions and services carried out in providing care. As we see here um, mapped out in this slide, the, pro the provision of care is the, the provision of medical services, administration, logistics, health and safety, vaccine refrigeration, um, and many other aspects of care will be affected by the lack of energy. Energy also affects working conditions and contributes to staff recruitment and retention. Given cross-cutting functions and influences of electricity is a critical determinant of not only availability of care, but also the quality of many healthcare interventions provided. Despite the fundamental role that electricity plays in healthcare prevention, many healthcare facilities do not have access to electricity. So we have here the status in um, low and middle income countries. It's estimated that 1 billion people globally are still served by health facilities with no access to care. And results from a WHO uh, systematic review documented that data, uh, nationally available data on electricity access is quite sparse, but from the data that's available, one in four health facilities do not have access to electricity at all. In the case of low and middle income countries, there's an opportunity for governments and external partners and other stakeholders to respond to healthcare provision needs by using clean and sustainable um, energy alternatives such as solar or hybrid systems to limit fuel costs, but also more importantly, climate change uh, emissions and pollution. The situation in high income countries looks a little different, where the challenge is not to increase access to energy, but instead a need for much higher environmental efficiency, coupled with healthcare services that have an environmental footprint that contributes 
to environmental uh, related threats to human health. Reducing pollution is equally, if not more important than in low and middle income countries where greenhouse gas emissions are comparably less. The challenge instead is in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, for example, the uses of gas in therapies as listed here and from healthcare related transport or in the healthcare supply chain. This can be accomplished through uh, many different avenues, but uh, uh, as examples, improving building design, electrifying transport, and investing in energy efficient technologies. Given the urgency to better understand and respond to energy deficiencies in health facilities in low and middle income countries to reduce harm or green health care in both high income and low and middle income countries, WHO and other stakeholders are working together to tackle these challenges. As an example, in 2015, WHO and the World Bank led uh, a report identifying opportunities to modernize energy health services in resource constrained settings. The overarching recommendation from the report was the need to have closer cooperation between health and energy sectors. This led WHO and other UN agencies to establish the Health and Energy Platform of Action, known as HEPA, in order to improve cooperation and response both at the political and technical levels. Other recommendations include better monitoring to be able to understand what the situation is on the ground, but then also to better understand how to scale up clean and sustainable en energy through improved research, policy, financing of technological innovations, and capacity building. In closing, increasing energy access or the energy transition to cleaner, sustainable energy will not be accelerated by itself. It requires systematic change to current policies, institutions, and societal systems. Thank you for your attention and looking forward to more conversation. Many thanks, Lydia, for this presentation. What I take from this is we need more cooperation between health and energy, and uh, that can also help us to tackle the energy access issue. So thanks very much. We're going to come back uh, with uh, lots of questions for you in the Q&A. But uh, for now, uh, let me turn to uh, Beatrice to give uh, her the floor to speak a bit more about Mexico's city's experience um, and learnings on, on how to tackle air pollution. Beatrice is from the WRI, uh, working on air pollution and um, uh, co-leads the Global Air Quality Program and is really collaborating not only uh, on, with, uh, on the topic in Mexico, but really um, around the region and the world, uh, developing strategies and programs on how to accelerate the path to cleaner air. So Beatrice, if you would uh, turn on your camera and your microphone. Um, then you should also be appearing on stage here with me. Um, and then I'll hand the word over to you. And if you unmute yourself, then we can also yeah. hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ren21, for the invitation. Um, my, my pleasure to, to share. Uh, it was mentioned before that we have to open our own bubble, so very happy to to merge with this bubble of renewable energy uh, i would just like to just to emphasize uh the air pollution has been mentioned before has many impacts and 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 we we sometimes uh only thought about one of them but it's, it's clear and lydia just mentioned the health impacts uh in in uh, for air pollution we know who are the most vulnerable but little is known that uh, that air pollution is also is also affecting our food production because the air pollutants, the different air pollutants, affects our food production. Uh, so agricultural systems are actually impacted. Our water, I mean, these pollution, these pollutants uh, actually change the the pattern of water, so they disrupt some rain patterns. And uh, we know that some of these air pollutants have also global warming potential. Uh, and, and we all know that uh, these air pollutants are not only affecting our own health, but also the, the broad diversity. These air pollutants affect uh, our plants, our forests. So that's, that's important to, to consider that the air pollution is actually impacting more. We also have to remind our own that uh, uh, ourselves that air is a key 
resource and um, and we all breathe and air pollution it is we only have one atmosphere so having that in mind i will just continue um, focusing on on mexico city so the idea of sharing with you some uh, mexico city so if we you all know that uh, mexico city was known in the late 80s as the most polluted city in the world um, that uh, how is now and how renewables can tackle this challenge well uh what is mexico city mexico city is one of the 32 states in mexico it used to be a federal district the 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 image that you see in green in dark green in the middle that's mexico city which uh, uh host 8.8 million people uh, and we are surrounded by a metropolitan area from another state that's the metropolitan mexico city metropolitan area that all together adds to 21 million people so you can imagine how much energy is needed for hosting either 8 million people or 21 million people so how is the energy matrix in mexico city mexico city uh uses most of the energy from gasoline and electric uh, energy comes from 23, about 24%. We also use a lot of diesel, uh, a lot of LPG, and a lot of uh, uh, oil, light fuel oil. Um, we, some areas in Mexico, in the Mexico City metropolitan area, it's actually, they use some wood and charcoal. So that's, that's the amount of energy that Mexico City uh, requires. Well, having that in mind, and how air pollution is, is affecting. Well, over the years, uh, I mean, the good news, yes, it was known to be the most polluted city in the world. That's also because we, in the 1980s, we had, as, is, as we do have now, a good air pollution monitoring. So having that information allowed us to know how bad the air pollution was and how it has improved. So what you have in the, in the slide, in, your, in the right side, is a, is a mosaic. Each is a little square, it actually represents the highest concentration of ozone of that date. And if you see from the top to the bottom, it goes to 1990 to 2019. Uh, I guess this is uh, 2019, but you can actually access and see the mosaic. So if it's purple, it was really, really bad. If it's green, it's good. So as you see over the years from 1990 and then from January to December, you can see that the air quality has improved. So we don't have many purple. We do, we do still have some red color, which is a bad air, very bad air quality. And we are aiming to have more green color. So yeah, that has taken some years. And how that reflects in terms of, of health benefits. So there was a study that compared how air pollution was in 1990, how air pollution was in 2015, and comparing the health statistics, it was uh, one of the conclusion was that, um, I mean, in addition to prematurely that avoid during this period because of air pollution reduction or improvement of air quality, uh, there was a life expectancy increases in all, uh, the, the life expectancies increase in, uh, uh, in citizens of Mexico City, uh, in addition to the health, uh, I mean, to the mortality uh, or premature mortality being reduced. Um, so, well, this actually, it was a, how it was possible. There were many policies, uh, mainly tackling uh, uh, industries, uh, automobile reductions. But one thing that has come over the last years is how renewable energy could contribute to improve air quality, not only reduction in CO2, but also air quality. So this is just an example of the Mexico City latest energy, uh, renewable energy program that uh, was uh, published uh, a couple of years ago and it goes into 2024. So it lists all the all the things that they are trying to do uh, from they, they actually call the solar city program that includes a lot of solar uh, water heaters. It's important to just to remind that in Mexico the water is mainly heat and and the gas that I mean that the fuel that is used to, for cooking it's actually LPG and natural gas. So if you consider all the emissions that comes from this activity, not from the leaking of the gases of the LPG and natural gas 
before it's burned to produce the energy, plus the emissions when this is burned. So this is a list of what they are doing. And well, just to mention, yeah, there's a reduction of 20, 41 tons of PM 2.5, one of the pollutants that has the highest impact of health. Uh, this is not too much comparing to the 55,000 uh, tons emitted, but it's, it contributes, and especially for those who are near to these emissions. Uh, so the concentration or the exposure to air pollutants is much higher when you are close to this emission. So it is good. There's a lot going on, and we hope to have more, more, more and more, not only the authorities, but the, the regulations. We also have regulations, the standards uh, for the solar panels, uh, for building new houses, uh, and we, we need more activity from the citizens. But what are the challenges for Mexico City with this huge... Um, so what you are seeing here is a map, it's, a, it's an animated map of a forecast of air quality. In this case, it's sulfur dioxide. And what you see in the top and, and how that plume is moving, that plume of air pollutants are moving based on the wind patterns. So in certain times of the day, certain times of the year, all this pollution that comes from a reef binary and a power plant that uses heavy oil and natural gas comes to the city. So it's not enough what the cities are doing by themselves and the citizens of those cities, but it's important to align the national policies regarding energy production, because whatever you produce in one part, all these pollutions actually don't stay there, they move and they can affect others. So with that, um, I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to continue this discussion with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Beatrice, for this uh, presentation and these inspiring stories uh, Yeah, from Mexico City. And what I hear from this is it's not only important what the city does, but also what the national government does and uh, how they collaborate to, in order to achieve this goal. Mm -hmm. And I see that I now have Sandra with me. So we've solved uh, the technical issues. So I'm really glad to have uh, Sandra from the Climate and Clean Air Coalition uh, Secretariat here with me, um, who is working on the Health Initiative and Household Energy to give us um, yeah, an overview of the impacts of air pollution and public health and some uh, actions and inspirations that we can take. Um, over to you, Sandra. So thank you so much, Maya. And um, yes, I went into the matrix. I actually popped up somewhere. And um, so anyway, <laughs> I'm pleased to um, find myself back on the stage. And um, it, I think Katrina is going to load my presentation. Uh, perfect. So thank you so much, everybody. Again, my name is Sandra Cavalieri. I coordinate health and household energy for the Climate and Clean Air Coalition Secretariat. And pleased to be here today to talk about our overarching um, strategy to link climate, health, and air quality in order to motivate the shift to renewable energy. Um, so uh, many, many of you may know that nine out of 10 people worldwide do not breathe safe air. And um, many of you also know that the sources of air pollution are also um, the sources of, of global warming climate change. And so what we are doing at the Climate and Clean Air Coalition is working on reducing uh, what's called short-lived climate pollutants, black carbon, methane, and HFCs in order to, um, well, let, let, maybe let's move on to the, to the next slide. And um, oh, this is in order to achieve the Paris Agreement, the 1.5 degree target. So if you look at the graph, you can see that the top line is, is business as usual. Um, the next line is, is mitigating carbon dioxide emissions only. And the yellow line is if you only reduce short-lived climate pollutants. Um, and then the, the last little dotted line there is what we're going for. This is if we reduce carbon dioxide and short-lived climate pollutants at the same time, we'll slow the rate of warming and we'll also achieve benefits for health, agricultural crop production, and the sustainable development goals. Um, and so if you move to the next slide, this is really um, the motivating piece of our, of our work. Um, we're, we want to reduce pollution, not only for, to reduce the rate of warming, but also for our health. 
So air pollution is what we call the invisible killer. It's causing non-communicable um, diseases like lung cancer, stroke, heart disease, lung disease. And this problem is global, but it's also disproportionately impacts um, people living in the Western Pacific, Southeast Asia, and Africa. And so our, our whole call to action is really um, to reduce and mitigate pollution in order to achieve health benefits and climate benefits. Um, so next, please. So together with the World Health Organization, the World Bank and the UN Environment Program, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition um, helped launch the Breathe Life campaign in 20, 2016. And what we're doing with Breathe Life is we're really, the first piece of it is trying to raise awareness. So the WHO collects data from around the world um, in the air quality database, air pollution database. And, and basically these databases were and only being used for research. And so what we, we had the idea that um, if more people knew the, what the air quality levels were in their city and their country and the impacts to, their, to the health of their population, it would motivate action. And so for over, over the last few years, we've really been working to raise awareness. Um, and now we have a UN International Clean Air for Blue Skies Day. And we have a lot of um, action from the health sector and motivation from the Secretary General, the World Health Organization, all of the organizations behind this in order to really bring the message to, to people that, that um, air pollution is, is bad for your health and also bad for the climate. Um, next, please. And so with Breathe Life, we are, we are steadily signing up governments who uh, are committing to take action on air quality to achieve WHO air quality guidelines by 2030. And in this process, we're highlighting the solutions and increasing capacity to um, take action. And I think this is really where renewables come in. Um, I think when we think of the solutions, uh, the people working on this are just sort of assuming that renewables are like a core piece of the solution and and maybe now through this conversation we realize that um, renewables are linked maybe more to climate change than they are to air quality but the same sources are really driving both problems and so if we can motivate people um, for their health and for their children's health maybe we can um, advance these um, policies more quickly next please um, and so lastly, uh, we are working to inspire action. So the Breathe Life website is trying to um, highlight these cases like what you saw in Mexico City, um, actions in, uh, that are happening all over the world right now, where governments are really um, advancing on renewables, advancing on the different um, in interventions, but it, it's, it's, it needs to scale dramatically, as you know. The renewable, um, renewable energy for electricity needs to dramatically scale by 2030. And the question is, like, how do we go from today to achieving these goals by 2030? Um, I really like the REN21 city, um, city report that was referred to earlier. This um, graphic easily uh, or makes it easily easy to see uh, that policies are coming online, um, regulatory policies, financial policies, enabling policies. Um, but the, the, the question is like, how do we get more of these policies, but then actually how do we implement these policies and really motivate individuals in their roles as air quality managers um, and all the way up, up through government to actually, uh, and the private sector, the health sector in order to drive this change. Um, and last slide, please. So thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity and um, look forward to the, the discussion. I think we have a shared vision around the world of what we want to achieve. And now the question is, how do we do this as quickly as possible? Thank you very much, Sandra, for, for this presentation and for giving us these thoughts and also inspiration on how we can take action. And with that, I'll hand over uh, back to Rebecca to get us started for some more networking. 
Thank you, Leah, and thank you to all of the speakers for those great presentations. So what we'd like to do now is uh, take the next 10 minutes for you again to um, have the opportunity to get to know each other a bit better and also to dive into the content of the discussions. Um, in order to do that, we've given you a framing question to discuss and we will be sure to put that in the chat as well so that you can refer back to it. Um, do feel free what, you know, to jump around tables again if you'd like to, or if you're happy where you are, stay put and you know, dive into the discussion. So the framing question is, what are the top ideas from the presentations and discussions that you've heard so far that could promote uh, renewable energy in the clean air and healthcare agenda? Welcome back, everyone, and we hope you had a really great uh, time sort of discussing and, and moving around the tables and getting to know each other and delving into the topic a bit further. So at this point, I'm delighted to invite back to the stage Rana and our three speakers, Sandra, Lydia and Beatrice. Welcome back, everyone. It's great to have you back up on the stage. And what we're going to do is we now this is this is the part um, of the, uh, the the session, if you like, that gets really really um, interesting. Um, we're going to have a, a Q and A. We're going to be um, jumping in um, to hopefully what will be a really lively and interactive discussion. Um, and so. For those um, participants who haven't yet had a chance to put their questions into the Q&A, um, please do. Alternatively, if you would like to come up to the stage, you'll remember that my colleague Katrina showed you how to put the, hand, uh, the raise hands feature. So um, if you would like to ask your question live, you'd be very welcome to. So while we wait for the questions to come through, um, I'd love to ask uh, Rana, you know, from your perspective, any observations around um, the presentations and discussions that you'd like to share? Many, and I will try actually not to monopolize the discussion here. But the first one is um, maybe just um, so from our invitees here, I only know Sandra. I'm meeting Beatrice and Lydia, and I think this is actually something which uh, which I feel is uh, is worthy to mention because, to some extent, it also shows how the discussions are happening in distinct ecosystems. Because I know that Beatrice, Lydia, and Sandra, you know each other well. You see, like you probably meet each other, or you know each other. You meet each other in uh, in. Uh, the different events happening, etc. And I think this is something which was mentioned at our table, for instance, also the part of air pollution and climate. You see how there is like the sources are the similar, but uh, there are like uh, different discourses around it. And um, I think it would be really interesting. So I have many questions after these presentations. I thought like that's super exciting. And all the time I thought like, okay, which of these pollutants are directly tackled by renewable energy. So is there any data? When you're looking specifically, um, I think uh, Beatrice and Sandra, both of you uh, were indicating good air pollution monitoring. Um, when you're looking into countries that really move to uh, renewable energy, um, do we have quantifiable data? which underpin the story where we really have the evidence and where it would be really interesting to develop a joint narrative that might be targeted to the air pollution space, to the health space, to the climate space, and again to uh, the renewable space too, so that we are creating echo chambers in the different uh, dialogues. So this is one of the questions. I can probably go on with many others, but some thoughts I had after listening to your presentations and um, so who'd like to jump in? Beatrice, would you like to jump in? Yeah, I mean, definitely. There are many ways of uh, uh, building an, a good narrative because we do, I mean, different stages. Of, but one tool is the emissions inventory. So where the pollutants are coming from and uh, when, uh, what time and what location and from what source and what type of pollutant. So that's a very important tool that is, is well known for the greenhouse gases because emissions inventory for knowing where your CO2 is coming, CO2 equivalent is mm -hmm. similar. Actually, it was developed before the, the, the emissions inventories for criteria pollutants we call, and there are many 
right? I mean, they are, it's, it's a group of criteria pollutants, but you can go actually to evaluate how toxic air pollutants are actually increasing or being reduced, and you can identify from where they are coming. So that's one tool. And the other tool that you mentioned that is very, is very important is the uh, ambient concentrations or personal exposure or street level air, uh, air quality monitoring. And, and it's known that uh, uh, when, when some energy um, ways of producing energy are being changed, or how can you relate to what you are seeing in the air quality monitoring, or what you are seeing in someone who has a personal exposure monitor? You can definitely correlate that exposure, that ambient concentration to where that uh, source is coming. So there are some key issues, like for SO2 is, uh, or sulfur dioxide is very well related to the burning of fossil fuel with high sulfur content. Uh, PM 2.5 is both related to energy production either from fossil fuel or biomass burning. So yeah, those are good indicators and that also calls uh, and there's more and more um, need and, and demand from citizens to have access to this data. What are they breeding and where these air pollutants are coming from? And the more we are aware of that, the more the citizens or the different sectors are actually able to tackle and reduce these emissions from specific sources. Mm -hmm. I would just also add that um, I don't, I don't know if, if um, like I like the idea of calculating the avoided emissions from renewable energy and making it extremely clear um what you're what you're gaining by avoiding you know and so i don't actually know if there are um summaries out there from from ren 21 or other like renewable energy focused groups that that do those avoided emissions calculations but that's also a place where you can add black carbon mitigation avoided black carbon and pm 2.5 um and avoided um other other sorts of avoided emissions, HFCs, methane. Um, so I, that's a like a question. I don't I don't know if there's a big summary, but that would be super useful. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can answer from Renton on site. I don't think there is a big summary. Um, there is certainly in scenario analysis. Um, it's very clear that the avoided CO2 emissions are there, and I think this is correlating again to the renewable energy production or avoided fossil fuel use. And from this element, it's very clear that we could probably derive uh, such indicators that are again relevant more for the um, air pollution health um, ecosystem or discussion, city uh, discussion. So. Um, I'm asking the team in parallel, if you have ideas on resources, please plug them into the chat. But um, I think here we basically already have a concrete action plan for <laughs> let's bring our data together and uh, develop joint narratives. I think there is, uh, there is probably, I'm pretty sure we have much evidence than which we can put together. Mm. And Lydia, from your perspective, you know, anything that you'd like to share? Um, so I would say that in line with what uh, Beatrice suggested in terms of the um, emissions that we're most concerned about from the healthcare space are the, you know, kind of the usual suspects, greenhouse gas emissions, we're talking about like CO2, but then also we're concerned about particulate matter and also nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxides, but primarily the agenda is focused on decarbonization, so really reducing CO2 emissions. Um, and a great example of, uh, of a healthcare system that is sort of leading the way is uh, the NHS in, in the UK. And so they have this great agenda, I think, by 2040 to reach this net zero emission. So this is from a high income country perspective. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to mention that. Thanks. Maybe just to, to sorry, I, I'm jumping in, but building on this, I, I found it, when I was listening to your presentation, Lydia, first I thought like, how is this related? How is this related? So I understand how it's related, but I thought like, um, I found two points really interesting. When you spoke about staff, uh, staff recruitment and retention, 
Mm -hmm. And this echoed very much with what we heard from the city space about how air pollution contributes to livable cities and how renewable energy also contributes to livable cities, basically, and uh, there is a governance issue. And then while thinking about this, I thought about um, there's kind of a kind of a circular economy concept here so there's a part of fossil fuel air pollution health and then we need to move to renewable energy and so your negative impacts are going down <laughs> once in a while and the renewable energy is going up and is also uh, contributing to energy supply and energy security and more resilient energy infrastructure so i thought like maybe there is a kind of interesting concepts to develop so that we look uh, into yeah, how to build on each other beyond the primary parameters that are visible. Then just uh, yeah, it's a very interesting observation. I appreciate that. Yeah. Mm. Great. Well, should we should we have? I mean, the questions are coming through okay, thick and fast here, mm. and we always we we always run out of time. I should just caveat it, um, and we, <laughs> <laughs> because um, you know it's it is a very lively community. So. From from uh, from your perspective, I guess um, a couple of questions here, um, which is which are around. Well, here's one that I think is quite interesting, um, and maybe there's a straightforward answer to it. I doubt, but what are the costs of air pollution for the global and national public health systems? And particularly, are there any recent studies how these could be reduced by going uh, renewable, ideally 100% renewable? Is anyone aware of that? Anyone want to jump in? It's the World Bank that really has the um, cost of air pollution um, most recent um, figures. And I, I think that they're planning on also, um, I, I forget the year that, that it's from, but um, I can look that up. But uh, the, the cost of air pollution figures have, are going to be updated probably pretty soon by the bank. And I think they're going to show that the costs are far exceeding even the the, the most recent figures. So I, I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure if there's any specific look at renewables in that assessment. So um, that would be something I think interesting to look at. Just like we at the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, we're always trying to um, look, like, add the additional angle of looking at short-lived climate pollutants. I think it seems like we also now need to be also adding renewables into every discussion so that there's an opportunity to like, you know, get all of our resources to scale up renewables. Thanks for that, Sandra. Um, then yeah, another just, question. Oh, sorry, you jumped no, in. The, 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 just building on this, uh, building on this, because I think like um, here, um, I, I would imagine that the cost is basically massive when you're only looking at air pollution. But when you're also looking into uh, cost advantages of moving to renewable energy and what it means in terms of um, health infrastructure, etc., um, the numbers are probably more enormous. And so, yes, the ministries are separated often from the responsibilities. But when you're bringing this down again at the city level for instance having a huge number can help each of the agendas so it might also be one of these parameters i mean dollars or euros is uh, an indicator everybody understands so maybe that's also another interesting entry point a way of making things visible and, and can i just add that i mean among the the, the studies that are being published or some like the decarbonization of changing from one matrix to another one or from existing technology to a cleaner technology what usually shows is that the the cost is much lower than i mean the investment is definitely lower and and much um, i mean the 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 health benefits and the costs associated to the health benefits is much higher than the investment that you need to do and, and it's really shocking sometimes it's two three times the benefits related to the investment that you need to do. But you have to consider not only like the premature deaths, which is very important, but also the quality of life. Those who are getting sick and getting the small kids who are actually having some impacts in the whole development for the whole life, uh, uh, people who are sick. And we are seeing something that we have to consider is that those that unfortunately has been infected with COVID are now part of this vulnerable population that we already know that it was there. Um, and they are more susceptible for air pollution. 
So the cost mm -hmm. is, is really high. And I guess, uh, yeah, it helps a lot to just quantify in dollars or euros. But something that we just have to keep in mind that uh, exposure to air pollutants actually is, is, is the society who is paying for that. So the benefits are really huge. And maybe a question because we are observing similar advantages, I guess, and even uh, economically in the renewable energy discussion. And still, uh, discussions are decisions are not always taken in the right direction, and fossil fuel capacities are still being built, etc. What are, from your views, um, the main draggers, I guess, in the discourse and taking the decisions? And um, are there maybe some which uh, are, are there maybe parallels to the renewable energy world, and we could think about how to strategically tackle them together? There seem to be also a lot of questions. Oh, hello. This was a question, actually. I was wondering. <laughs> Sorry, Rebecca. This was a question. Do you have a? So, what are the barriers? Sorry. I will mention that uh, one of the barriers is, is, is this silo community that they do not interact among each other and actually see the pros and cons of moving to one energy to another one. I mean, like really considering the cost and, and the benefits. And I guess sometimes it's maybe not enough information or not enough uh, evidence that actually uh, could allow decision makers to go to, to to something else. Now, when you have fossil fuel in your, I mean, in your place, and you have availability, well, you can use it, but you have to use it efficiently, and you use the other one, the other uh, 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 fuels that you have. So it's, it's it's actually diverse diversifying, but really thinking of what are the impacts of using one or the other matrix. So that's where renewable energy has a lot of, of potential. But we really have to get this community to talk about each other. Something that we were saying: share data, try to make the case, really analyze with with a good uh, and, and an integrated view. It's not only from the air pollution or the climate change of the renewable energy perspective, but urban health, social issues that we just have to consider. So I guess something that we just have to go into that direction to, to talk and to build the narrative very strongly with pros and cons. And so decision makers and citizens in general can actually take, uh, take the, the decisions that we need to be taken. So I have a response to an earlier question that I wanted to build off what Beatrice said, and then also just an observation from also a comment that Beatrice just said. And so, yeah, when I when you asked the question, Rebecca, about costs, I mean, um, there is, of course, in financial terms, but then there's also the public health cost or the, you know, how, you know, in terms of morbidity and mortality. And so Beatrice uh, mentioned mortality. And so we know, we don't know the the impact on health from the healthcare perspective when um, within the healthcare context when you have air pollution. We don't have that quantified. However, from the um, household and the clean cooking perspective, we do have an estimate and that's around 4 million people who die prematurely um, from um, household air pollution attributed to uh, lack of inefficient energy sources or inefficient technologies. And so there's that there's that burden in terms of health burden, but then there's also the morbidities that was alluded to um, that will carry on lifelong. So if you have a pregnant woman who's exposed to these pollutants, how that can affect not only her health, but also the health of her newborn. Um, then the other thing was, I, I completely agree with Barry, uh, Beatrice's comment about the sort of silos that we have within the energy sector and even um, the challenges and opportunities we have with our multi-stakeholder platform that Sandra is also a CCAC is a part of with HEPA and how we're trying to um, address this head on. And so bringing uh, energy bringing folks from the energy community, bringing folks from the health community, um, and having these difficult discussions. And so you may have noticed in my statement, I mentioned clean and sustainable energy, given that WHO is technically uh, technology agnostic, um, but very much in support of renewable energy as a response to the challenges, the health-related challenges we have to air pollution. Um, but very much, you can hear that people are, um, 
very much tied to their solution, but how can we find um, kind of the right mix of responses to help countries transition, or not really help countries, they can help themselves, but support decision-making for countries to be able to plan their transition and, and make uh, reasonable and feasible attainable goals to be able to, um, in some cases, increase access and in some cases, increase efficiency um, and so forth. So just wanted to mention that. I'm going to have to step in very quickly at this point and just say um, to those individuals, participants who have to go at this point, thank you so much for joining us. But for those who are able to stay on the line, we would love to continue to have this conversation for a little bit longer. Um, and so, but we do want uh, just to acknowledge that there are, because we said it was an, an hour and a half, if you know, then please do feel free to jump off the call. Um, I, I just find it really exciting and heartening to see in the question about can we collaborate more? What do you need from us as a community? You know, what, how can we help you, etc. So I'm, I'm acknowledging those questions and I'm going to say uh, have a think about answering those. But I'd also like to say we've got a couple of people who've got their hands up who want to join the stage. Um, and the first person is Vanji Danube, and I'm hoping that Vanji is going to be able to join us on the stage. Um, Vanji, hopefully you can turn your camera and your microphone on um, and we can make it happen. Hi, welcome. Um, Vanji. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm quite, uh, I'm so happy to be back on this uh, quick discussion. I'm, I, I want to be very fast, I mean, so very quick, so I don't want to uh, waste more time. I would like, first of all, to acknowledge our conversation is quite relevant. I'm, I'm happy to be part of it. Now, the only contribution I would like to, uh, by the way, I'm from Cameroon. I'm based in Nairobi. I work for United Nations Environmental Program, Global Environmental uh, Monitoring Unit. That's where I'm working. I'm based in Nairobi. Now, the only contribution I would like to make, you know, to really um, to make sense about what I would like to say is it's quite simple. This other aspect that uh, I would like all of us to consider is the technological you know approach to tackle the issue of air pollution and we talk, about, we talk about technology we talk about basically the instrument that provide the metrics in order to have the tool for the government to have the data available to com comprehend what exactly are the different type of pollution so talking about that most of the devices that we have on the market nowadays actually rely on the power grid and then I think more attention should be actually put into place to see exactly how those devices could actually more, I mean, could be uh, actually rely more on solar panel or some other source of uh, renewable energy than the power grid. Because nowadays in the project I'm, I'm dealing with, you have over thousands of devices, technology that provide the come up, I mean, that, 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 that they developed. Then few of them actually rely on uh, solar panel. So what can we do exactly in order to have them actually optimize the design in order to make use of the solar system? Because by doing so, definitely, we are going to have a more data range of, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, devices that are more available than the devices that rely more on power grid. So I think that's something that you also need to consider in terms of developing sustainable infrastructure for deployment of uh, air quality devices. Thank you very much. That's what I wanted to actually just uh, propose to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ranji. And so, does anyone want to comment on what Ranji's just said? Would Would anyone like to pick up on that? I, I'm suspecting there's wholehearted agreement, but um, anyone want to comment? I'm happy to kick it off. Um, so, a couple of thoughts that came to mind was that um, so WHO has a compendium of medical devices, uh, and some and so that's just in, in general, um, and so devices that would be used in the healthcare setting, and uh, some opportunities that have been identified is to um, make sure two things: one, that energy is considered, and so a lot of times when we talk about healthcare provision in the public health context, in you know, in, in, in the healthcare context, we're really thinking about um, 
the service being provided, but maybe not the how exactly. And so that energy is considered. And I think this also brings uh, the opportunity that, you know, to talk about what's the energy demand and, and how to meet that. And that will then hopefully bring on for more discussions about efficiency and renewable energy and the different energy sources. And so that's something that we're really advocating internally. Um, COVID has been an opportunity to have these discussions in house and really build um, that thinking into the practice of delivering care. Maybe I just I just thought one day, even though I'm not the air pollution person here, but I recall we had a huge discussion when we prepared the first edition of the Renewables and Cities Global States Report. I think uh, Leah probably thinks about this in another <laughs> behind another screen. Um, that we found out that uh, in apparently on the African continent there are only uh, two or three official air quality measurement stations, and that this is also contributing to a very low data available to decision makers uh, to take the right decision. So um, I guess like it's probably something really interesting to bring to the debate, like uh, what data is the minimum standard to take the good decisions and how do we ensure that in um, in economies where energy security is basically energy supply is still a, a big problem um, that uh, the renewable energy community can provide a solution here. Yeah, uh, Rebecca, I can quickly say something about that before we move on. Very quickly, and we're going to have to. Um, we, we we've got a couple more questions, so yes, Vanji, very quickly, jump in. All right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Rana, that's what you are saying is quite uh, true because uh, now like this, we only have the EPA. So what happens is like uh, during the calibration process, we only have to identify the station uh, equipment that are deployed within the U.S. Embassy in different country and then find a way now to deploy the device close to the, to, I mean, to that EPA equipment, so as now to establish the calibration process. At the end of the measurement, over a period of three to six months, then we can now exactly see how we can uh, get the data to make it so close to the standard equipment. I mean, those processes are quite, um, uh, they're having some challenges, but we are trying to see how we can actually relate it. Um, I also just want to add, like specific to Africa, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition is conducting right now an assessment of short-lived climate pollutants for the African region. And um, we've conducted this assessment in the Latin American region and also um, in the Asian region prior to this. And the African assessment is also going to be looking specifically at sustainable development goals. And so I think that this is going to provide um, a lot of new data that's going to be coming also like uh from emission like development of emission inventories for the countries in africa that will you know kind of like then uh add this whole other level and and maybe this is also an opportunity that somebody from your ren 21 team um working in the african region could join this um assessment process um mm -hmm. and and look for these kind of um connections of where, what, how data could be presented that would make it more useful um, mm -hmm. for the community. The other thing I just wanted to say is about the power grid, like um, something that I've been learning about recently is just like scaling up e-buses, electric buses in um, cities in Africa. Like one of the important things is, uh, for example, in Abidjan, there's um, an opportunity right now to purchase electric buses instead of natural gas buses. And the importance of doing this is that, like Beatrice said, they, 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 if, if Cote d'Ivoire wants to use natural gas, of course, but it's better, more efficient to put it into, the, um, into electricity and then have the um, buses being run on uh, electricity from natural gas, which then in the future can be more easily switched over to a renewable energy source rather than um, building up an entire natural gas bus system, which will take much longer to switch to renewable energy system. So if we use the natural gas now to power electricity, it will be easier in the future to have renewable electricity supply. So I, I just wanted to say that um, I think there's just obviously like so many combinations of solutions, but uh, that's one that I think is really interesting. 
And maybe just to build on this, uh, uh, sorry, Rebecca, but I think it's really important to jump in because we have done analysis on looking into uh, countries and cities that have basically e-mobility targets or policies. Um, and we realize that very often this is actually not integrating uh, where the electricity comes from. And it's not directly linked uh, to uh, linking the electricity supply to the renewable supply, even though. And as a result, I think this is also a message that need to be added and we need to give government's guidance because for many governments that do not yet have a natural gas supply it does actually it's a huge effort to start doing this it, it's actually uh, not the least cost option and um, there is another aspect to take into account that very often the renewable electricity is a more resilient solution and when we're looking in particular into the public transport sector as security on the supply, energy supply, is also one of the basic basis elements for having a public transport uh, security too, which is fundamental so that customers are going to use this. Thank you, Rana, for that. So, and thank you, Vanji, for being so brave and coming up to stage as the, as the first question. Um, I believe we have another question from uh, Felix Acrofi. Now, I'm, I, I think he may be joining us on the stage in a moment. Um, if you can turn your camera and your microphone on, Felix, if you're there. I'll give it a couple of seconds. Um, yep, here we go. Here comes Felix. Welcome, Felix. What can you just say a couple of words about yourself, who you are, and then your question very quickly? Absolutely. Hi, I'm Felix Akrofi. I work with ICLE uh, World Secretariat based in Bonn. And I um, think that it's going straight to the question in the interest of time. Um, or, well, not necessarily a question, but maybe a contribution. I think up to the point where we talked about the cost that I thought maybe we could take one leap further and talk about okay, yeah, we determined how much it costs. Let's talk about financing. We did this is one part that we have not uh, touched based on even in the group discussions that I was in. So I thought it was important to kind of bring this to the fore. And um, uh, being uh, from and uh, working with cities, I think that I was I'm speaking from the perspective of local government and uh, as uh, I mean, I've worked with Sandra uh, in the CCAC on the brief campaign, we've managed to um, create some level of awareness and got some cities to commit, uh, make commitment. But then that is where it ends. And I think the, the issue now is how do we go further? Finance is obviously one of the big uh, blocks. And also um, as it relates to how do we build the capacity of the cities to be able to develop projects or project that will be considered bankable to be able to leverage or get the necessary financing to be able to implement this uh, project that are renewable energy based and will be able to uh, achieve this air quality uh, or uh, yeah, the air quality ben benefit of air quality. Um, maybe I should just share a little bit of an example in how we have handled this, this phenomenon uh, in one of the projects. So one project we called, uh, we, implementing with UN Habitat is the urban Let's project. And in this project, we uh, it, we, uh, it, it, we implement this project in Latin America, uh, Africa, uh, East, South, Southeast Asia, and Southeast, Southeast Asia. But um, taking the African context, noticing that financing is the, is the challenge. And we also wanted to demonstrate to policymakers that this is doable and this has benefit. We went on the tangent of um, uh, using like a small seed money to establish demonstration projects. So this project would be able to indicate uh, like this, in, in a specific example, we, were, we targeted greening the health sector or health, uh, greening the health sector. So the link in a bit to the presentation by Lydia, uh, some health centers were identified and um, we tried to uh, build their resilience to energy by establishing or in, in implementing some uh, solar uh, solar panels and uh, establishing this so that and they will not be fully dependent on the on on the, on the grid, but that's also a good for the health sector and also reduce the, the impact that the health sector has as far as uh, pollution is concerned. Now, this is a good model because they are able to see readily see 
how what the benefits are in terms of the economic cost uh, and also the social part that the, the social economic part that Lydia mentioned. And putting this together, this kind of helps to create the evidence that's needed and, and the national government should be able to use this as a model to scale up. So this is what I want to chip in and maybe the conversation now would be how do we look at financing uh, these interventions and what would be the approach. And uh, yeah, in ICLE, there are also other interventions like the TAP, where we are collecting projects and we are from the local government and we are giving them this kind of support to enhance the bankability to make them more attractive to financiers. So we'll be happy to engage with, um, with you partners to see how we can take this forward. Thank you and over. Thank you, Felix, for that. Um, so um, does anyone want to just pick up on what Felix is talking about around the financing and the bankability? Any comments, uh, observations, Sandra? Or I mean, Beatrice? Yeah. <laughs> Sandra, you jump in. You jump in. Um, well, I, I was just going to say, I think that the, the financing feels like it's going to improve. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about how there isn't specific financing for air quality, but there is specific financing for climate change. And I, I don't know what the like specific to renewables is, but I do think that as we, um, as we uh, have more and more scientific evidence coming forward about the multiple benefits from mitigation that together, like with the climate community, um, we can we can bring resources to bear to um, to to scale up the interventions. So I I agree it's obviously always a problem like who's going to pay for it. But I think it's also like we have to be clever about um, how we are connecting the dots right now um, as far as mitigation overall um, to achieve all of these multiple benefits for the SDGs, for health, for climate, for agricultural crop production. Thanks, Sandra. And Beatrice, did you want to jump in and say a couple of words? Yeah, I guess, and it also relates to what we were saying before, like how, how to have a bankable project, a, a better, uh, of more appealing. And it's, it's not only of uh, CO2 emission reductions, is not only of air pollutants, it's actually of the social benefits to those who will get benefits for, for having this access to energy, which is, we, we know that it's, it's not, there's a, it's a very important pending issue in terms of equity. So I guess if we just present it like that, and as, as Sandra mentioned, unfortunately, air pollution is, is one of the areas that has the less uh, uh, finance or the less resources over the last years. And it's it's incredible because that's what you are getting a lot of benefits. So, but again, I mean, if we instead of working on silos, is that what is the project? What are the benefits? And can we estimate the, the benefits in monetary benefits? But what about the social benefits? What about uh, I mean, how can you quantify the the, the 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 improvement of the quality of life, of the access to services? And I guess whenever we are able to that to present that. Uh, it, it should be more appealing, especially for cities, because the cities are actually looking for enhancing, improving the quality of the citizens. And that includes access to transportation, access to hospitals, access to education. So we have to present in that. And we don't want all that access with very bad air pollution, because at the end, I mean, who pays is, are, are the, are, is the citizens, are the people who are paying for their with their own lives. So I guess... Uh, I mean, coming to the beginning, this is good that we are mixing the bubbles and try to make the, the case in a more integrated way. So uh, I, I totally agree with you, Felix, uh, how to make this, I mean, how to use this case study of the successful um, cases in which you can actually integrate that from a whole perspective. Thank you. Rebecca, may I quickly jump in? Sorry, Lydia, go ahead. 
Oh, um, I hate to be a broken record, but I just wanted to mention that the health and energy platform of action again, HEPA. And so I mentioned it before, it's a platform that brings various stakeholders together to be able to tackle uh, some of these issues that have to do with air pollution. And um, it's already been mentioned that maybe there isn't direct financing for air pollution, but then this is a way to start addressing it. And so two of the uh, primary focuses are uh, clean cooking, so household level um, uh, air pollution mitigation, but then also um, but also healthcare facilities. And so one of the missions of HEPA, which kind of operates at a technical level, and so really uh, trying to bring together the evidence that Sandra has been mentioning um, from various stakeholders interested in these two um, big significant problems uh, facing especially the most vulnerable. Um, and so, yeah, so HEPA has decided that kind of raising uh, financial resources is really high on the agenda. And so they're operating on the technical level, but very soon there'll be the first meeting of the high level coalition, which is sort of the political arm of HEPA. And the high level coalition um, consists of ministers of energy and health, but then also heads of uh, UN agencies and other international agencies focus on this topic. And so it has primarily uh, energy and health actors, but then also climate change actors like the CCAC and also uh, folks uh, that are focused on gender and equity. Um, and so coming at it from these various lenses to be able to um, ultimately address this big challenge of air pollution and raise financial resources to be able to address this challenge. Okay. Maybe just to build on this, but also this question of finance. And I think in the in the Q and A, there were much decisions about um, where are the decisions taken, who are the decision makers. Um, I think we understand there is a, air pollution is a local question, but uh, may have a regional impact. I mean, we saw this uh, in Beatrice's case how it is moving. Um, so, who are the key decision makers you have around your table, and who could or should become our um, our primary, secondary, or whatever target audience when we are trying to frame our data, knowledge, insight, solution stories uh, to reach them? And are there somewhere you feel that um, we should, from the renewable energy community side, specifically bring to the renewable energy debate the ecosystem you are operating in that might not be confronted all the time to a solution. I think, um, Sandra, you had mentioned about uh, air pollution, the, how did you call this, the invisible cancer or something like this? The and invisible uh, killer. I, sorry? <laughs> the invisible killer. <laughs> oh, the invisible killer. Yes, uh, not the cancer, the invisible killer. And then I thought like, um, does this mean is renewable energy the invisible solution or one of the invisible solutions? Certainly one of the solutions, but more invisible than others. Um, so I don't know, what about decision making in your ecosystems? Who do you target primarily? Well, I can just say from the Climate and Clean Air Coalition side, um, we, we mostly have ministries of environment engaged, but that's something that we've always tried to um, expand. So as, as time goes on, we see that we have a lot of interest from, from, well, you have interest from other ministries, but maybe not enough. And so I think that's why the HEPA platform is so important, because like Lydia said, it's ministries of um, ministers of energy combined with ministers of health. So the, the health ministries have been a key, um, a key piece of our theory of change. Like if we have health on board, then we think we can advance much, much faster on climate. Mm -hmm. And I think HEPA is like the next step. It's like, okay, now that we already convinced the health and climate community, now we bring in energy and then it's really finance ministers I think to Felix's point um, about how are we going to actually finance this, and so I would say the target audience to me, in my mind, for renewables is really the finance um, ministries because I think I think it's almost like everyone else is already on board with renewables, but but we don't know how to like scale it up, um, and so that's why I think you know maybe developing a joint report on avoided. Um, avoided mitigation from from you know when you from the green building to the like green healthcare facility to everything in between like 
um, you know, green public transport. Like once you have this calculation of the avoided mitigation and you have the calculation of the um, avoided cost to society, then maybe you more easily generate um, funding for large scale projects. Thank you, Sandra. Um, anyone else want to jump in? And by the way, I wanted to just say thank you very much to Felix as well for being the second volunteer and the final volunteer to come up to the stage. Well, I, I would like to just mention that city level, I agree with Sandra, like in terms of national government, um, you definitely need to involve not only the energy, but the health, the environment and definitely the finance. And at, and at the city scale is, is similar and more and more we have more cities, uh, mayors of cities, of uh, governors of the states who are actually in that, in that idea of uh, contributing to reduce um, CO2 emissions. And, and that they actually have uh, cleaner action, I mean, um, climate action plans. What we have found in some cities is that the cleaner action plan, the climate action plan, and the economic plan are not actually connected. So those mm -hmm. cities were actually effectively connecting those three and develop an economy. And just the example that I, I, I mentioned to Mexico City, the, 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 the agency that is actually coordinating now this solar city project is is not the environment i mean of course the environment secretary build the whole thing and make the the analysis as, as sandra mentioned how much mitigation what are the missions that will be mitigated and there are some calculations of what will be the health benefits but who actually put that in plan in terms of financing is the is the, fi is the financing secretary of the uh, of agency so they they have to be so again, it's an integrated view because yes, I want to contribute to reduce my CO2 emissions, but if you see it and you estimate how much uh, jobs are actually going to be generated by these transitions, they are good data. So the more we um, connect the benefits because air pollution is always fighting, we need a clean air and these are the solutions. So why, as Sandra mentioned, how we can use, just uh, jump that, uh, that barrier and actually do it. And when you present the data and how a city will be benefit uh, of all the, the of all these changes, and as Sandra was mentioning, well, probably now it's better just to use my gas to this other thing instead of just spreading the whole process. Because as you spread that, you also spread the pollution, and you are actually exposing the most vulnerable to these emissions from exiles or from whatever you produce the energy. So I, I would say that in terms of the cities, those who are actually integrating more the solutions and definitely have environment and health in one of the, the first um, seats uh, and they gave the, the voice and the priority that always uh, the, the most successful uh, opportunities you will have. The opportunities for ha having successful implementations. Mm -hmm. Maybe a quick question, Beatrice. Um, you didn't mention transfer. We had the one of the last IREX um, was in Mexico City, and it was crazy um, congestion and the impact, uh, obviously, on GDP losses, air pollution, etc. Um, did transfer play a big role in in moving the air air pollution part? Because you didn't mention them from the ministry side. Oh. Definitely. Transportation, I guess, uh, transport sector is one of the most convinced of, uh, of going to, I mean, expand the, the energy matrix and electromobility mm -hmm. is something that is something that most of transportation agencies are considering. But again, how you jump into the challenges, mm -hmm. that's, that's something that has to be. And, and some, for some cities and some, for some transport sectors, it's easier. And for others, it's more difficult. But that's definitely a big opportunity. But I, I don't think that that's something that you have to convince a lot. Okay. Um, okay. There's already some Because it's visible, and, basically. Yeah, yeah and, and because of in many cities, transportation, especially the middle income and the high income, that's where most of your air pollution is coming. In middle income and low income, you have, in addition to transport, you have many others. And that one is, is, is the one that Lydia was mentioning in the household the cooking and heating in a household, where you actually have very, very high concentration of pollutants. And those who are most, most, most exposed are women and, mm -hmm. and 
and kids and women since they are girls and up to then they are older so that's an issue of gender that we also have to consider but i, I would think that transportation is one of the sectors that are more a little bit more in advance in terms of recognizing the the benefits of renewal maybe just to share two numbers um 23 numbers in the power sector around 26 percent of renewable energy share heating and cooling 10 percent transferred 3.3 thank you for and that, this is Ron. basically the way we see it from the renewable <laughs> side and we see that yes much is happening but how does this come that we don't manage to connect the dots what are the barriers here and also why we're looking into alternative routes i guess to make uh, renewables visible in the portfolio of actions. Thank you. And I hope you don't mind me stepping in at this point. Um, <laughs> I always feel, you know, and it's a testament, like the chat's been lighting up, the participants have stayed on the call. So clearly this has been a really, you know, valuable and, uh, you know, a rewarding discussion. I know there will be a few of you disappointed that you didn't get to ask a question on the stage and there's a couple of unanswered questions in the chat, but please do stay on afterwards for some more informal networking and, um, you know, and hopefully our speakers, uh, I believe, may be able to stay on for a little while longer, although we've already lent on their goodwill, I think, for well over <laughs> the time. So um, what I'd like to ask the panel, and maybe Lydia, you could leave lead off on this, is just, you know, for a key takeaway from today's discussion ideally something maybe a bit action oriented but just a key takeaway for you from today's discussion that you could share with everyone yeah i think a, a key takeaway um, is the importance of uh, cooperation and collaboration and so as we're talking about uh, cooperation between um, health and energy transport um, so many other sectors that are involved in really um, taking up this um, the, the challenge of responding to air pollution uh, and, and collaboration. And so earlier, Rana asked about the various decision makers or really um, decision makers that are involved. And so, you know, researchers, uh, folks in various healthcare professionals, um, uh, you know, city level and all the way up to global level, uh, you know, decision makers. And so, yeah, I'd say the key takeaway is the importance of cooperation and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. And Sandra, from your perspective. Um, well, yeah, I keep thinking about how we're going to make this happen by 2030. And I think that we do have a lot of networks and a lot of um, opportunities, like, like Lydia saying, to collaborate. But then it's also to um, translate this knowledge so that it can be um, scaled up so that if you do have uh, you know, an air quality manager or a health care facility manager or a any like individual that you can imagine in charge of a transportation system anywhere who's thinking, gee, I want to like take this step, like Beatrice said, like jump the line, like how do I like get there that we make the information extremely accessible so that people know who to go to to ask and that they don't just have a fleeting idea but just sort of move on with their daily work but go above and beyond to actually make these things happen so whether it's fi calculating financial information or calculating avoided emissions or calculating health benefits like what what do we need to provide in order for people to make the choice thank you sandra and and beatrice from your perspective totally agree with Lydia and, and Sandra. I will just add that uh, uh, one, one good um, um, uh, opportunity is also to, to enhance and to promote more of these community, learning communities, like sharing. Definitely one of the allies for renewable uh, energy is, is definitely the air pollution sector, the air quality sector, because we are already convinced. But I totally agree that we, we sometimes we don't have the how and so we have to interact with other sectors and definitely the finance and, and just learning how others have done and, and, and really do the leapfrog. We cannot wait two, three decades, something, something happened. We definitely have to do it fast. 
So I will invite the renewal community to just uh, uh, join more and, and actually uh, interact more with the other communities, the health and the air pollution and the climate, because we are already convinced that that's one way of going. Thank you so much and thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you, Beatrice. And at this point, I'm just going to say um, over to you, Rana, to wrap up the formal part of today's session before we go into informal networking. It's been a complete pleasure to be moderating today. So thank you very much to all. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Rebecca, and thanks for leading us through this event. And um, yeah, from my side, I think I'm I'm basically building on uh, building on what you all said. I, I think there are lots of opportunities for synergy. The reality is, um, I, I think we know each other, we connect. Um, it's probably good to have very concrete um, action points and kind of collaborative projects, whether it is a, an exchange of data, making sure that we always make sure that um, health, the health voice and the air pollution voice and the city voice are in the energy sphere, uh, but also the renewable energy voice is basically in the different ecosystems um, and then probably thinking about either a knowledge sharing product or a communication campaign or something uh, a workshop series where we can continue exchanging and learning from each other um, and understanding the thinking because this is probably um, something which uh, and also just addressing each other's blind spots so um, I, I guess like this is again one of these rendezvous where we feel like uh, it's only a start of hopefully a longer process where we can um, together accelerate the change uh, much more because I think we all have like this 2030 um, in our neck and feel very concerned about the little time that uh, that remains um, and then yeah I just want to say a big thank you to our panelists. Um, it was really a pleasure. I think it's uh, um, it's always great to also identify basically the different ambassadors and um, connect the community. So I really hope that we'll have the opportunity to work together more or start working together. And thanks a lot for everybody who actively participated on the tables, in the Q and A's, et cetera. Um, we couldn't address all questions, but I really invite you to, uh, for the ones of you who still have time, please stay on um, and connect, interact, um, and um, we can move to our virtual rooftop bar. So you'll discover another area of uh, the rent in one the rendezvous space. And thanks a lot to the team for organizing this and uh, for Leah for guiding us through uh, the panels. and. Uh, Looking forward to see you down in the networking area and soon elsewhere. Thanks a lot.